What about mutations? Mutations and other genetic alterations are cited as the mechanisms used by evolution to add genetic information. Problem, they don't. Okay? Mutations lead to a loss of genetic information. Now let's talk about mutations and, and look at some of the basic, two basic broad categories of mutations. First of all, it is possible to make changes in the DNA which do not result in a change in the protein. Now I didn't have time to get into all that, but humans, animals, plants, even bacteria were designed with DNA repair mechanisms, first of all, so you could actually repair it before it becomes a problem, certain quality control mechanisms, and compensation mechanisms, okay? So if you do have a change in the DNA, it doesn't necessarily result in a change in the protein. Now the other broad category of mutations is that a change in the DNA does lead to a change in the protein, like I shared with you about my graduate school work and the mice that I worked with. Uh, a change in the protein can equal problems, okay? Uh, you see this a lot with cancer. You see this, obviously, with the mice that I was talking to you about. Big problems in that case. Now, again, w mutations do not increase genetic information. They actually decrease it. And Lee Sputner says in his book, Not By Chance, all point mutations, a point mutation is a uh, single, uh, basically, one basis change that has been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information, not to increase it. And this could be said of all mutations. All mutations we know of so far do not increase genetic information. They actually reduce it. Now, some people would challenge me with the idea of beneficial mutations. Um, I agree, there are mutations that occur that give beneficial outcomes in a given environment. I think that's maybe a better way to maybe describe beneficial mutations. It's more or less beneficial uh, outcomes in a given environment. For example, we're going to talk about antibiotic resistance. And then we're also going to talk, um, another good example of that is wingless beetles on a windy island. We have an article on that on our website. You know, that's great if you're on a windy island, hey, but if you move to a mainland, it's a problem. You can't get away from your predators as well, and it could be very problematic. So again, it's a reduction of genetic information and it's only helpful in a given environment. And you know, I see this idea so often ignored by evolutionists because they still use mutation as a mechanism for molecules to man evolution. Because it's all they're left with. You know, the supernatural is not a possibility. It must have some sort of natural explanation. So we're going to take a look at this using antibiotic resistance because I kind of like to um, talk about bacteria and work with them. And, and so, and it's a really good example to use because you see this one so often in the media and in textbooks and to really help us understand this better. Now this just is kind of a funny little comment here. It says, it was on a shortcut through the hospital kitchens that Albert was first approached by a member of the antibiotic resistance. It says, hey kid, want to be a super bug? Stick some of this into your genome. Even penicillin won't be able to harm you. Okay. Now it's just kind of a funny take on this whole idea. But how do antibiotics really work? Well, Antibiotics are basically going to interact with a protein that the bacteria already makes for some purpose, whether it be making a, whether maybe it helps with making proteins, it helps getting nutrients into the cell. It has some function, and also it just so happens that this antibiotic interacts with that protein, and when it does, it causes the organism to die. And we're going to take a look at, at one of those in particular. Now, so what do bacteria do? They got to survive. They got to deal with it. Unlike us, they cannot come in from the rain, okay? They can't get out of that environment. They have to deal with it. So they alter their DNA. They have mechanisms for increasing the rate of mutation in the hopes that one of those mutations will lead to a change in the structure and thus a change in the function of that protein such that the antibiotic can no longer interact with it and then they don't have to worry about the antibiotic. They can survive. Now, however, though, remember, they've made a change in the protein, its structure and possibly its function, Hey, right? There's a price to be paid for that mutation. It may help them in that environment, but there's a price, okay? It may not help them if they move out of that environment. Now, that's one way in which they can become antibiotic resistant. Another way is, like you see illustrated here, they can get the genetic information from another bacteria, okay? Now, it's not new genetic information, okay? It already was in one microorganism, and it's simply moving to another one, okay? It's not new, okay? It's just maybe new to that microbe, but it's not new in general. So it's just moving around. 
and bacteria do that a lot. Now let's take a look at an example using the bacteria Helicobacter pylori. This is a picture of it here. This is the uh, bacteria that's responsible for causing about 80% um, of ulcers. And um, nowadays the treatment for ulcers is simply antibiotics for the most part. And this was discovered back in the 1980s in people that had chronic gastritis. Now this is basically Helicobacter pylori on your stomach lining. Okay, now not to show this, you know, before dinner, not to gross you out too much here, but this is what it does to your stomach. <laughs> it puts holes in it, okay? It basically allows the acid to eat away at your stomach as a result of their interaction with the stomach lining, okay? Not fun. Any of you who have ulcers know this is not a fun thing to have. Okay, so what's really going on here with us? Now, if we look at Helicobacter pylori, okay, the normal version, so to speak, um, Antibiotic, can, when, when the individual who has an ulcer takes antibiotics, it's absorbed through the cell wall, it actually interacts with an enzyme that converts the antibiotic into a poison. Right? And that's how this one works. Each of them works a little bit differently, but that's the example here. What does that do? Kills it. Okay? That kills the bacterium, and that's what you want, and then the person is able to get rid of the ulcer. Now, here's the problem, as we all know they become resistant, right? like we just talked about. They have mutations, they get information from other microorganisms, and now they're resistant. About, in third world countries, almost 80% of H. pylori is now antibiotic resistant, and in developed countries, 10 to 30% is. So again, here we go, problematic. Now, in this case, the antibiotic still gets absorbed through the cell wall, but they have a mutation such that they no longer produce the protein that the antibiotic or interacts with. They don't make it, right? which is pretty extreme, but they don't make it at all. And so it can't become a poison and they survive. No enzyme, no poison, no death. But why did they survive? Not because of more genetic information, because of less. They now don't make a protein that they made before. Now what happens though if you take the normal kind and the mutant kind and remove the antibiotic, take it out of the picture? Guess who wins, right? The normal guy, right? Why? Because he's producing some, this enzyme still. He's producing this protein. The protein actually is an enzyme that helps them break down nutrients, right? So they can compete better. The normal guys can compete better when the antibiotic isn't around, right? They have the ability to make that enzyme. They have the ability to break down nutrients better than the mutant ones do. And so, like I said, there's always a price to be paid <laughs> for what they're doing. It's beneficial, you know, it's mutation that are a beneficial um, outcome in a given environment, okay? It's very, very specific, so to speak. So, mutations don't do it, and natural selection doesn't do it. So again, let's look at the two questions to help us evaluate what we've learned about mutation. Is mutation an explanation for how evolution could occur? No, okay? Mutation does not increase genetic information, so it's not an explanation, so there has to to be something better. That God designed the organisms with an enormous amount of genetic information, as I said before. But as a result of the fall, mutations have decreased that information and, along with natural selection decreasing genetic information, we have the species that we see today, and that's the better explanation, not only because it's based on the evidence, the scientific evidence, but because it's based on the Word of God.